You're listening to all things content from Avenue CX, delivering you cutting edge insights into the past, present, and future of all topics related to content. Here's your host, Kevin Nichols. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kevin P. Nichols, and welcome to my podcast. I'm super excited today. Uh, Today we are joined uh, with Paula Land, a very good friend of mine and an expert in, I think, all things content and and digital, for that matter. Paula and I go way back, um, but before we begin, let me give a quick introduction. She's a founder and principal uh, content strategist of, well, first of all, she founded Strategic Content, which was her company. Uh, she's also an author of a book entitled The Content Inventory and Audit Handbook, which, uh, by the way, is one of the few books that I use on an ongoing basis as a reference book. Uh, she wrote it a few years ago, but it's still highly, highly valuable, and I use it um, pretty much on most of the projects that I engage with that need or involve content audits or inventories, which is what we're going to be talking to her today. And we're going to flash that up on the screen so you can actually see the book and you know where you can get that. Um, she's also a guest lecturer at the University of Washington Information School. In addition to all of that, she's a member of the Content Strategy Best Practices Initiative. And also she works at NASA, so you can't have a more cool job than that. So welcome, Paula. We're really excited to have you here today. Thanks, Kevin. Excited to be here, and especially to talk about my favorite topic. <laughs> and I don't even remember when we met uh, for the first time, but we've known each other for several years. Uh, it probably was at a conference of, you know, in San Francisco or Seattle or someplace. Yeah, I think it was at a conference. I think it actually may have been at Confab. Yeah, p- perhaps, or maybe even before then. You know, I don't, I don't know exactly. Oh, and you did have the content audit tool, which used to be. I, I was saddened that it. I know that you had sold it, or um, the, the, you had sold that tool, but I was saddened uh, to see that it it's no longer in existence because that used to be one of my favorite tools, and I know that you um, invented that tool. So, <laughs> rest in peace, content audit tool. Um, So getting to what we are here to talk about today, which is content audits and inventories, because you really are one of the foremost experts of of this in the entire world. And again, I could not recommend your book on this more. Um, Just recently, it came across my desk that the Wall Street Journal conducted a content, well, actually an audit of its content and its coverage of its paper. And it's obviously a newspaper. Um, but it was very really interesting. The New York Times ran a story on this recently, and they said that there were specific recommendations that came out of that audit that were around topics, and they recommended in this audit that stories incorporate <clears throat> more featured content on wellness and diversity to attract a broader audience. And if they wanted to diversify their subscription and their membership and their audiences in the way that they needed to in order to improve revenue and to in- increase sales, that they really needed to think about the actual topics of the content and the appeal of those topics to a broader audience. Um, now, I think according to the New York Times, that audit was actually uh, shelved. <laughs> and I don't know if the recommendations are actually being followed. Uh, so I wanted to start there as a topic because I think it's interesting and it's coming from the publishing uh Uh, industry or the newspaper industry, but where I wanted to start with is that audits are often political, even if they're done for a website, and they're often messy, and they they, they bring all sorts of considerations that you probably don't think are necessarily going to even materialize when you begin the process of doing one. Um, What are some of the biggest unforeseen challenges you've encountered, Paula, when you were working on an audit or an inventory in your experience? Well, I think you kind of hit on it there with um, with them being sort of political and messy. Um, I think too, it may surprise people that I think the hardest aspect of doing an audit is not the actual process of doing an audit. It's the upfront 
buy-in. Um, it's, it's getting that uh, clear and well-communicated mandate to actually do the project. Um, and I say well-communicated because what can happen is that if everyone who is either going to participate in the audit audit or uh, have some of their, they are stakeholders and some of their content is going to be part of the audit, if they are not on board, then you can end up with something like it sounds like, like the Wall Street Journal did, right? Which is you can go through a whole process of doing this work, um, but if you don't have that buy-in, if you don't have a sort of corresponding commitment to actually using the results of the audit, then your audit may just end up on a shelf. And in the meantime, you may have actually damaged or, you know, had some had some difficult or, or messy uh, situations or conversations with, with your stakeholders. Um, so to me, that political aspect, um, that uh, communication aspect, that upfront, you know, making sure that everyone knows why you're doing it, what you're planning, planning to get out of it, making sure that everyone is committed to being open-minded about what comes out of it. Because one of the, one of the challenges is, you know, you are often auditing content uh, created by various groups around an organization, and some of them may be, may be very open to hearing, uh, hearing your evaluation of that content, and some may not. And, you know, that if you are kind of in the awkward position of being the, uh, the content strategist who is having to sort of fight those, those battles or, you know, bring those people on board, um, that can be really, uh, it can be really difficult. It's a difficult position to be in. So I, you know, would strongly recommend and, and certainly try in my own uh, context to make sure that I have that sort of organizational mandate and support so that there is sort of a, a you know, escalation process or there is, there's a way to, you know, just make sure that you know, it's not all sort of falling on me and I'm not sort of the bad guy for telling people that, you know, their baby is ugly. And what happens, like, it sounds like what perhaps happened in the Wall Street Journal case is that they got news that they may not wanted to hear, right? Like, right. they were perhaps told that that they were creating stories for, uh, and it wasn't all like what some people might think, well, it's the political slant or that sort of thing. It actually, some of what I read uh, the issue was, was that it was skewing to, uh, it was skewing to a demographic and a, and a generation that was uh, older and they needed to appeal to younger audiences with certain types of topics and that sort of thing. So one of the things that the Wall Street Journal does is it focuses a lot on financial topics, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, there may not be if they want to increase their revenue or they need to increase their revenue. I, I'm not saying this is the case, but it could be that there's not enough demand out there to support that. And so they need to open up for additional topics in order to bring in more of an audience. Right. Right. So what happens when you hit that type of an issue where you're telling somebody that their entire editorial strategy has to shift or be changed based on what you're uncovering. Well, it kind of goes back to all of that context setting up front that I just can't emphasize enough, right? So what it sounds like, you know, may have happened there is they didn't know or they, they may have a different idea of who they want to be mm -hmm. than what their audiences want from them, right? And so mm -hmm. there's, there's a sort of disconnect where if you're auditing um, and don't realize that, I mean, again, if, if you're auditing for people who are not going to be open to hearing that, then, you know, something, something was missed up front, right? And, and part of that is spending the time to do, uh, you know, stakeholder interviews if necessary, um, you know, look at, look at business goals, look at audiences, look at trends, right? If, if they were able, you know, if the auditors were able to uh, have that as, as their context and then go back and say, you know, look, this is what we're seeing, you know, demographically, uh, you know, your readership is, is starting to, you know, age out of this, or, you know, we, we want to, if you really want to remain viable, you need to start to appeal to a younger audience. And that's what we're going to be 
that's what we're going to be looking for. And that's and our recommendations are going to be based on that. If you don't want to hear that, if you don't want to expand your business or reach new audiences, then don't bother, right? <laughs> you know, I, it's, <laughs> you know, you've got, you've got to kind of have that, you know, that willingness to, to be really, I, I mean, I hate to use the word vulnerable, but I mean it, but I kind of mean that, right? That, that right. a business or an organization needs to be able to hear that, you know, you're kind of missing the mark here, or, or if you don't kind of change course, you know, you're, you're eventually going to miss that mark. And, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to do, you know, what my, as a, as an auditor is, you know, I'm trying to tell you, you know, here's where I see you kind of going off that path, or here's where I see, you know, where there could be improvements, or, you know, I see opportunities, you know, based on, uh, you know, what I know about, <clears throat> about your audience and those demographics. And that kind of brings me to another, you know, element of, you know, that sort of upfront context setting is besides knowing what the organization exists to do or what the business exists to sell, understanding everything you can about who their current customer base or who their current audience is, uh, you know, looking at whatever user research you have, looking at things like analytics, just to see what people are, are engaging with now. But then you also have to think about, you know, is that your ideal audience or do you want to, do you want to expand that audience? Do you want to prioritize one audience over another? I mean, most, most businesses, most publications have multiple audiences and they may have some that are higher priority than others. And so if for the Wall Street Journal, their highest priority audience are the people interested in financial news, then that's, that gives you a certain, you know, that gives you a certain lens through which to audit the content. But if they say, you know, that's, that's a priority audience, but we also want to, you know, reach more of say a lifestyle audience, um, then, you know, what does that mean in terms of how you scope the audit, what you look at, what criteria you set and so on. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I think one thing that your book and that you've really taught me, you know, over the years is that audits are really need to be built in sort of the DNA of a business culture for like thinking of it in terms of almost like the performance audit of personnel, but it, but it's for the content, right? Like <laughs> you've got to think yeah. of like looking at your content on an ongoing basis and in the web industry, you know, when we first started doing content audits and inventories, I think a lot of us thought of it as this is the beginning of the process for a web redesign. And we look at the current state to see what exists and then that'll tell us, you know, what we need to build. And that's not at all really how you approach an audit. Like you're approaching it much more from the standpoint of the business strategy and auditing content against the business strategy and the consumer needs and figuring out where the content can evolve and what is successful within that content experience. And that I think is fundamentally what you've taught me and what your book, for example, taught me about harnessing the power of content audits. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I mean, you can do audits for, for various reasons. I mean, you may also do an audit that's purely, you know, you, you're changing something about your branding, or you just want to make sure that, you know, that all of your content is on brand. So you're not necessarily, I mean, that obviously kind of ladders up to, to who you are as a business and how you want to present yourself and who your audience is. But but that's kind of a different, you know, potentially a different scope than really um, kind of having a, a, a real kind of business value focus. Um, you know, you could also audit in the context of uh, doing, doing a content uh, replatform, right? You may not be doing anything else but moving your content from one platform to another, you know, a new content management system or something. So, right. So you may audit in that scenario, you'd kind of look at different things. And, you know, in that case, maybe you're not doing a sort of qualitative audit per se, but you're looking for things like, you know, what are the, what are the, what are all of our content types and our content right. models? And, you know, what are, what are some of the, con the content features that we need to make sure, you know, can work in the new system and so on. But I think, you know, what you and I are kind of mostly talking about here are those sort of real qualitative audits in the context of, 
as you say, like a redesign or, um, or, you know, again, the, the kind of ongoing, I mean, the, the rolling audit, um, you know, as something that you sort of adopt as part of your kind of overall uh, performance tracking or, you know, the, the KPIs you, you track to as a business, if, you know, auditing your content to make sure that, um, your content is meeting, you know, those specific goals and you can map those goals to, you know, specific qualities or metrics about your content. Um, then, you know, doing that kind of rolling audit on, you know, whatever, whatever uh, frequency makes sense to you. I mean, you know, if you're a, a huge organization, you know, you might not be able to do something like that, uh, you know, every year or, you know, every six months or whatever. I think it really kind of depends on, uh, you know, resources and, uh, and timing and, you know, how frequently your content changes or how frequently your business changes. But, but definitely um, an audit is ideally not a one and done thing. You know, it, in fact, you should get better at it over time. You know, the first one, you're going to kind of hit some snags, probably realize that you didn't select the right criteria or you didn't define them well enough or you had some of those, you know, organizational issues, you know, the second time, hopefully you kind of do a little better job with those things. But if you get it, you know, installed as a regular practice within your organization and it just becomes something that everyone understands will happen on some on some schedule, um, you know, it just not only obviously does it make sure that you are regularly kind of weeding out your content, you know, making sure it's, it's uh, doing its job, but you're also kind of establishing a quality kind of mindset in your organization. Um, and if everyone is aware that, you know, you can't just sort of throw this stuff up there on the website and it's never going to get looked at again, or no one's ever going to question whether it's, you know, whether it's still relevant or it's still accurate, um, you know, that, that kind of seeps its way into your overall just kind of governance and, and um, site maintenance. Yeah. And your ongoing content planning and editorial, you know, strategy. Yeah, I think, absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think one thing um, that is also I mean, one question I wanted to ask you is, do you think that content ecosystems and companies can be healthy and successful without ongoing audits? Well, you know, obviously I'm a little bit biased here, but but I kind of think, <laughs> <laughs> but I tend to think no, right? Because, you know, just what we're saying here, you know, that, uh, you know, if you are not, you know, if you're kind of just literally never reviewing your content, you know, you're in danger of ending up with, you know, outdated, inaccurate, off-brand content, content that isn't supporting your users' needs, you know, and eventually that kind of comes home to roost, you know, and it's going to hurt your business, right. um, you know, without, without those learnings, you know, as you mentioned, too, that, you know, there, there is the audit to find things to fix, but there is also the audit to find gaps mm -hmm. and to find opportunities, right? So it's, it's not just, you know, here are all the things that are wrong with our site. It's like, you know, here's an area we could build on. You know, here is content that's, that's really good and is doing really well. Um, our users are engaging with it and it really is supporting a business need. It's driving people to a purchase or, you know, whatever your conversion goals are. So then, you know, that's, that's an area to kind of reinvest in or invest more in, you know, and it kind of lets you, you know, no organization has unlimited resources for managing and creating their content. So you want to make sure that the content that you are creating and managing is the highest value it can be. And so if you're not ever auditing it, you know, you're missing that opportunity as well. And then, you know, I, this kind of goes along too with sort of the benefits of the audit, you know, as I mentioned before, kind of building in that culture of, you know, culture of quality, a culture of sort of accountability for content. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, an output of an audit can and should also be some learnings that get fed into, you know, your content planning, you know, like we just said, but also 
updates to your style guides or, you know, your governance policies or revisit workflows? You know, what, what caused that content to not be quite as good as it could have been to begin with? You know, how can you mm-hmm. make sure that doesn't happen going forward? Because again, limited resources, you want to make sure you're, you're actually applying those resources as effectively as possible. So if you come out of an audit without any learnings, I would be very surprised. You know, I mean, any organization is going to come out of that going, okay, well, if, you know, this 20% of our content isn't really, we can't really map this to any business goal. We can't map it to a step in a customer journey. We can't, you know, show that it's helping users complete a task. Then why are we managing it, right? You know, may not even be bad content per se, but, you know, that gives you, you know, gives you a direction, you know, when you start to identify those patterns. And so in terms of thinking through the audit, right? Like, cause just unpacking that a little bit. Um, and there's a lot to think through. Um, how do you do it? Like, how do you, and I know you wrote a whole book on it and I know that this is more than just a 30 minute conversation, but there's a lot of organizations out there that aren't doing this. And, you know, we know that if you really want a healthy content ecosystem, if you want a performance driven one, if you want one that's standing your content up for continued success to stand it up so that content is an actual asset that can be quantified and measured and all that within your organization, you're going to have to audit that content and, you know, put mechanisms in place to evaluate its performance. But if you're not doing that, what would be your advice uh, for some key ingredients to to start thinking through how to how to put that into place? Well, it kind of again just goes back to you know maybe even higher than than the you know what are our goals? It's sort of what does what does our content what role does our content, whether it's our website or whatever else, but you know, tend to kind of focus on websites here, but what role does that play in our business, mm-hmm. you know, and meeting our business goals? Mm-hmm. And, you know, where, what are those goals? What are those objectives? Again, kind of what's what's the user, you know, who are our audiences? What do they need? And and so, you know, again, I, I kind of keep coming back to this point, but understanding that stuff up front you know, having that context, you know, what's, what's triggering this, you know, are we deciding to audit because we're seeing that, you know, our, our sales are down or, uh, you know, our donations are down or our analytics are showing that, you know, our traffic's dropping off or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, Or you just have a sense, you know, things feel outdated. We haven't updated this content in a while, you know, whatever triggers that, you know, being really clear about that up front, because that's going to help you scope it, and that's going to help you set your goals, and help you set your criteria. So, once you've kind of immersed yourself a bit in that, you know, like, why are we doing this? You know, what are the opportunities here? And this might be a way to kind of get that organizational buy-in, which is to, to be able to say, you know, look, here is this, you know, here's this current state, and here's some, here's some issues that, you know, or here's, some areas we want to kind of focus on or address, let's kind of baseline this, and then we'll be able to show, you know, how we can improve this. And that that gets to something a little further down the line, but that is sort of, you know, how do you act on it and how do you measure sort of the success of having done all this? But in, in any case, kind of back to, you know, set the context, understand everything you can about the business, about what it's trying to do or the organization understand your users, everything that they want and need and are doing, um, and what you want them to be doing, because those could be two different things. Um, And then, you know, then based on that, that's when you create your criteria. So what are the really specific points against which we're going to measure this content? And, you know, a qualitative audit is often kind of focused on things like, uh, you know, editorial quality and, uh, lang- use of language, tone of voice, that kind of thing. Um, is the content accurate? Is it current? Um, but, you know, as I said, you could also be checking it against a business goal. You know, if you had a set of three or four sort of KPIs, business KPIs that you're tracking, you know, which one of these does it support? Um, and, you know, or a, a step in the customer journey or so on. So, <clears throat> Getting all that up front, then you sort of decide what are those things that we are going to audit against. 
And then I think one of the biggest problems in auditing, um, particularly if you're doing it with other people, so if, you, if you've got a team doing it, is not being clear enough about those criteria. So not defining them well enough that not only, even if you're doing it yourself, you know, and, and might refer back to it later, you need to know exactly how you defined whether a piece of content met a particular criterion. Um, and all the more important if you have a bunch of people working on it, because, you know, this is subjective. You know, I mean, one person's bad is another person's, well, it's okay, you know. Um, so if you have this really clearly defined and say, you know, say you're marking, you know, you've, you've chosen uh, a rubric like good, fair, and poor for your, for, you know, a particular criterion, what does it mean to be good? How would you identify that? What specific things would you look for in that content? You know, and it might be something like, just say it's editorial, be like, you know, well-written, you know, no grammatical errors, no typographical errors, you know, whatever. So, so you kind of have really specific things. You know, what does it mean to say it's fair? What does it mean to say it's poor? So you try to take as much of that subjectivity out as you can. Um, but, you know, it's always going to be a little bit subjective, but that, that kind of future proofs it a little bit in terms of, you know, when you actually are done with this whole process. And then, you know, because this could take, you know, it could take weeks, it could take months, you know, depending on, how large the content set is and how much time people have to devote to it. So if you're returning to that later, you know, you want to make sure you know exactly what those meant, because otherwise you're kind of in a position of essentially redoing the audit, <laughs> you know, because now you don't remember, why did I say that, you know, piece of content was only fair. Um, and then just as kind of a side note to that, if you are doing an audit with multiple stakeholders, and I've had this experience do not, if possible, allow them to audit their own content. Have them audit <laughs> another team's content. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, the best and, you written know, prose I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and some people, you know, that's a generalization, obviously. Um, and you have to kind of take the temperature in your organization of how people are going to feel about this. But, you know, I mean, if they're excited about it and have been, you know, brought on board early on and understand why you're doing it and what could come out of it and, you know, the benefit of doing this. You know, and they're willing to be really, um, really sort of self-critical. But if you are having some of the people who created that content look at their own stuff, it can be it can be a challenge. And you know, it's it's human nature, right? You're going to be a little defensive of something you created. So, uh, do, you know, do you extend that? And I'm sorry to cut, but do you extend that to? So there's creator and there's creator, right? Like, do you extend that to? don't have a company audit its own website or I mean in an ideal setting should they bring in an independent expert to come in and I think there are arguments both ways but I but I do think you know especially and maybe this this um, reflects my experience of having you know done 12 years or so of of consulting um, coming in as an outsider, gives you a couple of advantages. I mean, the one obvious one is that you don't have those, those attachments to the content that the people in-house have. And you don't have necessarily the, the political issues. You know, you've, you've, you've been brought in, presumably everyone understands, you know, we have hired this consultant who is going to come do this, you know, get on board. <laughs> um, so theoretically, you don't have as many of those those challenges to fight. Although I will say, I have often been in the position of working, kind of being caught between, um, I won't say warring, but, uh, you know, different factions within a company yeah. who really have different, have different priorities and have different, um, you know, different goals or, uh, you know, expectations or whatever. So, so that can be a challenge. But I do think, you know, there is something, you know, coming in and, and having that objective experience, um, you know, people are often more open to hearing criticism from an outsider than from the person the next cubicle over or the next office over or whatever. Um, you know, it's it 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 kind of takes away some of that internal <clears throat> that internal um, 
conflict. Um, and, you know, you really are looking at it with fresh eyes. You know, you don't have the, oh, we put that up there because so-and-so requested it. And, you know, that person was, you know, the vice president and we kind of couldn't say no, that wasn't a good piece of content or whatever. You know, you don't have any of that. You know, you're coming in just saying, that's not a good piece of content and you don't need it. Um, so there's that. I mean, the the internal, uh, you know, the, the benefit, I suppose, of doing it, you know, as an internal person is that, um, that ongoing learning, right, which is <clears throat> we're doing this audit now, but we're, you know, we're going to learn from it. We're going to, we're going to uh, build what we've learned from it into our processes and into our guides and so on. But also, um, you know, again, kind of that, what I was talking about before of sort of creating this, you know, kind of culture of, you know, ongoing uh, analysis and, and improvement, you know, and, dedication to content quality that, you know, that that's something that a consultant may come in, you know, deliver some some results and go away. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people internally have sort of really, you know, internalized all that and, and built it out, which, which actually brings me to a whole other thing, which is, um, and again, one of the problems of, of potential problems of doing it as an outsider is, you know, quite often a project is scoped to the delivery of an audit. It's not scoped to the actual implementation of the results of an audit. And that is left to the people in-house. And so if they were totally on board with it and they're excited about it and they're ready to go, that's great. If they were not on board with it or suddenly they don't have time or something has shifted or some other big project is kind of reared up its, its head, then, you know, that audit might sit there on the shelf right or they don't like the you're right you're right or they don't like what the learnings are so they decide to ignore them and right. keep it as is yeah like the um, wall street journal <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're presuming that that's the case but yes. right exactly yeah um my apologies uh, if that's not the case I mean, and, and sometimes that's the case, but it's because they don't want to invest them. I mean, it could be very well be that the amount of operational or capacity overhaul that's required to support such changes is cost prohibitive, you know, or something like this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and it's maybe short term, maybe in the short term, it means that they have to hire up a bunch of journalists in their case to, to write. And, you know, particular mm -hmm. subjects that require subject matter expertise. Who knows? But, um, yeah, no, this is great. Um, I bet you also probably have all sorts of interesting little, well, I know you do, <laughs> uh, <laughs> horror stories that you could g give us in terms of, like, some of the worst case scenarios that you've seen in terms of content, but I'm not going to ask. <laughs> <Thank Instead, you. laughs> I'm not going to ask you to uh, tell me where the bodies are buried or give me clients. <laughs> um, but what I would love is just any, um, any kind of guidance of things that, you know, if you could go back and do things like, differently, what are some of the best practices that you've learned over the years, sort of the hard way? Like, what are some lessons learned that you would, you know, take moving forward and say, okay, here's things that I've learned and, uh, you know, you can use to sort of inform your uh, approaching this um, and doing this? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess it'll be a little bit of a broken record here, but I think um, I think the biggest learning is you know preparation and and really having a plan for it. I mean, it's not it should not be just sort of you know this task that happens over to the side. I mean, it really should be kind of positioned within the larger context of you know keeping your, your keeping your business, keeping your content. Um, relevant and doing what it's supposed to be doing, and and you know you can't you can't just kind of drop in and do an audit without really understanding all of that. And I think the times that I have personally struggled with audits, it's been either because um, you know they're they're 
just wasn't enough. I, I didn't understand enough of sort of the business context. And so maybe, you know, in retrospect, I would have looked at different things. I would have audited for different criteria. Um, so it, it, the more the more of that upfront, uh, you know, the more of that upfront work you can do just to make sure, you know, because whether you're a consultant or in-house, you know, again, you never have not only do you not have unlimited time to do these things, but you want to you want to take action relatively quickly. Usually, I mean, con, you know, sites evolve. You know, during the time that you're doing an audit, there could be you know, however many, a, a few to a dozen or a hundred new pieces of content, whatever, posted to that site. And so, you dragging it out for too long and having to go back and re-audit or kind of rethink it if you've sort of delivered results that people it wasn't what people expected or wasn't something that people can actually take action on. You know, you've, you've kind of wasted everyone's time and you've wasted some opportunity there. So, so all of that upfront work just to, to, you know, prepare for the, for the, the process and prepare the organization for the process, prepare the organization to know that, you know, there, there will be some expectation from you when this is over, you know, there will be, this is, this is not the work. This is the, preparation for the work and and it's going to guide the work and so without that you know again without that sort of having that really well understood up front you know then you then you're potentially in that position of delivering something that you know doesn't do what it needs to do and so that really is a bit of my sort of drumbeat <laughs> I love it this is not Process, the work yeah. This is the preparation uh, for the work. Paula Land, everybody. The book is Content Inventory and Audit Handbook. It's available at Amazon.com. And remember, there is a, uh, what I like to say is a uh, little place in hell for those of you that have independent bookstores in your backyard and don't get the book there. But anyway, please. Uh, Thank you. XML Press, uh, Paula Land. It's been lovely speaking with you today, Paula. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kevin. This was fun. I love talking about it. It was, it was really audits. fun. And we will <laughs> welcome you back. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day, Paula. And thanks for tuning in. Thanks. That was All Things Content with Kevin Nichols. Thanks for listening. Remember to leave a like and a comment if you're watching on YouTube, a five-star review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, or a follow if you're listening on Spotify. You can connect with Kevin on LinkedIn or follow him on Twitter at KP Nichols. You can also connect with his company by following Avenue CX on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook at Avenue CX. All Things Content with Kevin Nichols is a production of Kevin P. Nichols and Avenue CX. Thanks again for listening.